This conference will now be recorded. All right, we're just going to get started. Welcome to West Basin uh, Municipal Water District Water Policy and Legislation Committee and special meeting of the Board of Directors. It is September 21st. It's one o'clock. I'm calling the meeting to order. We do have a quorum, Mr. General Manager. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, we do have a quorum, but I'll go through a roll call just in case. Uh, All right, thank you. Here. Bondier here, yes. Chairwoman Gloria Gray. Here. Alternate Director Scott Houston. Here. Director Harold Williams. What is here? I believe he is online, uh, so we'll give him a few seconds. Uh, and I'll, I'll call Director Desi Alvarez, who I do not believe will be joining us today. So, Madam Chair, we do have a quorum. Okay, we will come back to Director Williams. Thank you. Um, I'm here. I don't know. Madam Chair, I'm sorry. All right, Director Williams is present. Okay. Thank you very much, Director Williams. We will thank go to you. item three. All right, thank you. Uh, item three, public comment. Is there any public comment, Mr. General Manager? Madam Chair, we have not received any uh, requests for public comment. Uh, I do not see uh, any member of the public here virtually, uh, but if there is somebody that would like to speak with public comment, please let us know. Thank you. And presentations? Madam Chair, there are no presentations today. Action calendar. We have no items on the action calendar. All right, we will go to information calendar. Uh, please uh, report uh, regarding this item. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the first item we have on our information calendar is item 6A, and that's our legislative update for the month of August of 2021. Uh, you can find this in your uh, packet page three. And I'll begin with the uh, Neomel Pappas and Associates update that begins on packet page five. And this is their end of the legislative session written update. Uh, we hope to have uh, members of NPA join us at a future meeting to provide maybe a little bit of the uh, background details of the legislative session. But I'm going to run through a couple of items for you uh, and then hopefully uh, answer any questions that you might have. As I mentioned, the end of the uh, first year of a biennial session uh, was September 10th. Uh, throughout this legislative session, there was approximately 400 bills passed by the California State Legislature. And now they are headed to the governor's desk for an October 10th deadline for the governor to sign any or all of those bills. This legislative session was uh, in the midst of several different uh, state issues and, and uh, obviously, uh, none none more known than the uh, pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, because of the COVID pandemic, you can see within the memo, uh, each legislator was limited to 12 bills for this legislative session. So you saw a, a pretty steep uh, decrease in the number of bills heard in committee and moving through the California State Legislature. Uh, you also, with the a background of Governor Newsom's uh, recall election. Uh, you did have an issue related to uh, what we would call controversial bills or bills that the entire uh, caucus could not rally behind. Uh, so you did see a number of bills that were blocked or stopped uh, from moving forward that could potentially move forward in the next, uh, the back end of the biennial year. On top of that, uh, there were significant budget issues, obviously with COVID-19. There were uh, several statewide projections that we would have shortfalls as far as our, our revenues uh, were concerned. And in looking at the governor's proposed budget in January, it did look like even the administration was expecting uh, budget shortfalls. However, uh, when the May revise came out, uh, we did see a steep increase in, in revenue, partially because of the uh, stock market, a uh, record-breaking year. Uh, but also with federal relief aid for COVID-19, uh, the state of California did quite well as far as uh, recouping some of their funds 
to, to pay for past services that they provided throughout the legislative session and the calendar year, uh, but also were or enabled to uh, repurpose those funds uh, for infrastructure projects. So uh, the, the ultimate budget was the biggest budget California has ever seen. It was a two uh, two, $262.6 billion. Uh, funded a number of different programs that perhaps uh, uh, Democrats within the California State Legislature didn't think they would be able to tackle this year. Uh, but you did see uh, dedicated funding for education with free preschool and lunches. Uh, you did see investments in broadband infrastructure, uh, some of which has been uh, earmarked for even the South Bay region. Uh, you did see uh, funding dedicated to health insurance, uh, small business grants, and of course, uh, stimulus for uh, California residents in the tune of $600 uh, for this year. And I think that when you look at that, that entire package, uh, a number of those items or the majority of those items were not expected to move forward this year. So I think that uh, if you look within the caucus, they would say it was quite successful. And as I mentioned, all of this was handled in the midst of a recall election. And I wanted to point that out because I think that um, uh, NPA has done an excellent job of summarizing uh, the recall election and of course the, uh, the campaign. You can find that on packet page six. But it is noted that uh, Governor Newsom ultimately within this recall campaign and this recall election, uh, there were two significant items on the ballot one of which would be the, the recall of the governor. And then the second question, of course, would be who would replace them if the governor was recalled. And it was uh, approximately about 64% uh, voted no on the recall. And then you can see within question two, uh, Larry Elder did receive the majority of that vote of about 40, 47%. However, uh, that was only 47% that chose to answer question number two. Uh, you can see just by the number of ballots casted and or cast, and then of course the number of votes for uh, Larry Elder, there's a wide disparity as far as the number of votes there. So you can see that a lot of people did vote, uh, obviously no for the uh, recall, and then chose not to answer question number two. But I think if you look at uh, the recall election, it did have significant impacts within the legislative session. Uh, first and foremost was the COVID response by the state of California. Uh, you know that uh, as the state of California began to reopen, uh, people generally were very excited about the opportunity to, to, to potentially go back to their what you'd call their normal life. Uh, but of course, as, as COVID numbers began to spike and you did have the COVID variant, uh, numbers have spiked in different parts of the state of California. And I think a lot of people expected the governor to take a, a very strong position or stance when it comes to COVID-19, possibly even shutting back down. Uh, but with this looming recall election, uh, the governor chose not to, uh, asked people to continue to uh, socially distance and wear masks, obviously. Uh, but even uh, the question as to whether you would mandate vaccinations was kind of uh, looming within the Capitol. And of course, uh, legislation was never actually introduced uh, because of the controversial nature of that legislation. Secondly, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, was the governor's drought response. Obviously, over the past several months, uh, the governor has been declaring emergency drought conditions within numerous counties throughout the state of California. Uh, and if you go back to the most recent drought, you see the actions taken by the State Water Resources Control Board which was ultimately led by our, our then governor, Governor Brown, uh, with a specific mandate of 20% reduction back in, in the last drought. I think a lot of people thought that the state board would, would respond similarly this year. Uh, and I think with the looming uh, recall election, uh, the governor asked for a 15% voluntary reduction, a uh, very significant difference as far as what we did in the past and what we did uh, this year. Uh, it is a 15% reduction from just your last year's uh, water usage. So it's a very recent, you're not getting any of that quote unquote past credit for investments, investments made in water recycling and water use efficiency. Uh, but I think that uh, the communities have responded. We, we are seeing uh, a, a decrease in demand throughout the state of California. And I think we'll continue to see that, but I would expect uh, that the governor uh, now with this recall election behind him, I, I would expect uh, further action within the state of California when it comes to uh, a drought response. Uh, 
And moving forward, I wanted to, to touch a little bit on uh, the California State Legislature and the governor's re response uh, in terms of infrastructure when it comes to the drought. And you'll recall that the Senate pro tem, Tony Atkins, really took a, uh, I don't want to use the term aggressive, but we'll say progressive uh, approach to, to seeing the, the writing on the wall and saying we need to invest in, in drought awareness uh, and infrastructure to bring water to the communities that need it. Uh, and so very early on in the legislature, you saw a $5.1 billion package uh, passed through and of course got signed by the governor. Uh, it does provide uh, funds specifically for uh, different water uh, departments and of course uh, water programs. There's $1.3 billion uh, for water and wastewater throughout the state of California. There's $300 million for uh, proper groundwater management, $200 million for conveyance, $400 million for groundwater cleanup and water recycling, and of course $100 million for PFAS and contamination cleanup specifically. Now, I know uh, several of us have had the opportunity to uh, go to downtown Los Angeles and uh, visit with our, our friends there at Water Reuse, California. And of course, the $400 million that is de that's dedicated towards water recycling is, I think, a, a successful story. But I think in the broader sense, the question is, uh, typically we've been able to, to get a little bit more. Uh, water Reuse is a very popular program uh, within the California State Legislature and of course within the communities. And when you look at the past uh, efforts by agencies like West Base Municipal Water District that have been on the forefront when it comes to potable reuse and the uh, uh, state board's effort uh, to, to potentially adopt uh, specific uh, treatment standards for uh, direct potable reuse, uh, I think that there was a thought that we could get a little bit more. So I wanna highlight that because $400 million is quite a bit. Uh, but I want to get into some legislation and talk a little bit about where where that legislation will lead to potential success uh, down the road, because I think we're very familiar with uh, some of uh, the bills that are included in the packet. Uh, but of course, Senate Bill 45 and Assembly Bill 1500 are our two quote unquote water bonds. And though the bills are now two year bills, they did not pass uh, the legislature this year. Uh, they do provide approximately 5.5 billion to 6.7 billion uh, respectively uh, for uh, water infrastructure throughout the state of California. And I know that uh, the California Water Reuse Association as well as the Association of California Water Agencies and Cal Desal and a handful of those organizations are really starting to rally right now as to, to how they're gonna work this legislation. So I think in this uh, interim period before uh, between the end of this session and the start of the next session, I think you're going to see the, the uh, coalitions begin to grow and really make a push for uh, funding for, for water recycling down the road. So uh, $400 million, I think, is a successful story uh, as far as this legislation is concerned. Uh, but I think that the reuse uh, agencies and associations throughout California uh, will be very proactive on those uh, the water bond uh, bills as well. Uh, I want to turn your attention now uh, to a couple of different bills uh, that we've been discussing throughout the legislative session. Maybe put them a little bit in perspective as to where we are going into the uh, the off season, and of course the next year. And uh, the first bill I have is Assembly Bill 1195 by Assemblywoman Garcia. Uh, obviously, this legislation was related to the uh, UCLA study that was introduced, I think, last year in January. Uh, was specifically related uh, to the uh, West Coast and Central groundwater basins and the uh, retailers within those areas. Uh, over the, the start of the legislative session, uh, the bill did morph and we did work with the author as far as how we were gonna position ourselves and of course where we would focus our attention when it comes to that bill. Uh, the bill ultimately was stopped and is now a two-year bill. Uh, it's my understanding that the Assemblywoman would like to still do something with it However, I do want to point out uh, that if you were to talk to several of the legislators that have been very uh, active in it, uh, I know that they've been working with Central Basin Municipal Water District throughout this legislative session. Uh, the new general manager there, Alex Rojas, is doing an excellent job of really working with the community and working with those legislators. So it's potentially, uh, you could see this bill morph into kind of a, a different concept possibly assisting the disadvantaged communities that were addressed 
within that UCLA study. And um, speaking, you know, just from, from staff's perspective here at West Basin Municipal Water District, when you looked at that study and you reviewed it, uh, there are issues uh, within portions of the uh, central groundwater basin, and you would like to see those uh, agencies assisted, especially when they're uh, providing water to the disadvantaged communities within those. So you're talking about those very small water systems, none of which would include any of the West Basin customers. Uh, so it would be nice to see that legislation kind of repurposed to address those issues. Uh, the next bill I wanted to highlight is Assembly Bill 361 by Assemblymember Rivas, and this legislation was related to the Brown Act, and ultimately, as uh, we've been going through the COVID-19 pandemic, you know that there's an executive order by Governor Newsom that allowed special districts to utilize uh, teleconferencing uh, during emergency times uh, for the purpose of uh, hosting their meetings in a safe, in a safe manner. Uh, Earlier in this legislative session, possibly with the looming recall election, the governor stated that he would not be extending that emergency order. And so there were specific concerns related to the Brown Act and hosting these teleconference meetings. Uh, as such, the bill was amended to include an urgency clause. And procedurally, that urgency clause requires a two thirds majority vote. It did receive that vote and it did pass the California State Legislature. And I wanted to highlight this because the legislation uh, with an urgency clause would actually take effect immediately upon the signing of the governor. Uh, but just yesterday, the governor did sign a new executive order when it comes to this legislation. And what he did is that executive order would uh, push this bill and allow it to take effect on October 1st of 2021. Uh, and that, of course, would be the day after that uh, emergency, uh, original emergency declaration uh, concludes. So it would be a seamless transition. And then, of course, uh, the Assembly Bill 361 would be implemented. So there would be no stopgap or, or need uh, uh, for concern when it comes to utilizing teleconferencing for these purposes. Uh, West Basin staff will work with our legal counsel as well as our uh, Department of Administration to make sure that we're in compliance. Uh, we've been doing an excellent job, I think, of working uh, within this teleconferencing mode when it comes to uh, hosting our meetings. And we want to make sure that we, we're continuing to do so properly and, of course, providing the public an opportunity to participate in our meetings moving forward. The next bill I wanted to highlight is Assembly Bill 818 by Assemblymember Richard Bloom. And this legislation is related to pre-moistened, non-woven disposable wipes. And I wanted to highlight this because this is an issue that uh, has been discussed uh, for years. Obviously, these uh, uh, pre-moistened, non-woven disposable wipes ultimately end up in our sewer system and, of course, uh, do cause problems. And uh, for those of us who have had the opportunity to uh, tour Hyperion recently, uh, you really saw the damage done uh, at Hyperion, uh, which was ultimately uh, caused by a slug of debris coming through the screens, uh, but you couldn't walk through the facility without noticing the the mounds and mounds of these disposable quote unquote wipes uh, that are going through that system. Uh, as you're watching the, the the water flow through their system, you can just see uh, numerous wipes kind of flowing through uh, every every couple seconds. Uh, and so I do expect legislation to be introduced next year possibly taking a harder stance on this. Uh, it's important to note that this legislation actually received no opposition. So I think it moved through fairly quickly, uh, but there is a question as to what they could do to ban ban these disposable wipes uh, down the road and, and possibly uh, remove them from the market. So I wanted to highlight that because obviously it did have an impact here at Hyperion. Uh, so we'll be tracking that issue in the next legislative session. The next bill I want to highlight is Assembly Bill 1434 by Assemblywoman uh, Laura Friedman. Uh, obviously, um, Assemblywoman Friedman is a former Metropolitan Water District director, very active when it comes to uh, water policy and water legislation. And this legislation is related to urban water use objectives and specifically the indoor residential uh, water use. And you might recall just a year or two ago, uh, legislation was uh, passed. Uh, AB 1668 and SB 606, I believe, that set the standards for water use efficiency for uh, urban water retailers throughout the state of California. And it created this framework where you would take your indoor residential, your outdoor residential, 
and then of course your CII, your commercial industrial institutional water usage. Wrapped up in that would be your water loss, and that would ultimately be your target uh, that you would want to meet to to prove that you're you're utilizing water efficiently. As part of the negotiations on that legislation, they did set that indoor residential standard at 55 GPCD, so gallons per capita per day. And over a period of five years, that would be ratcheted down from 55 to 52.5, and then ultimately to 50. So that would be kind of the ceiling right there, or excuse me, the floor right there of 50 uh, GPCD. This legislation would actually uh, change those uh, figures and it actually would start off with a, uh, a ceiling of 48 GPCD, and then would fall down to 44, and then ultimately 40. So not only would it be a lower than the original floor, if you will, but it actually has a steeper drop off, uh, whereas it would have originally dropped five gallons per capita per day, uh, now it'll drop a total of eight gallons per capita per day. Uh, and this legislation, when ultimately uh, introduced uh, at the very early part of the session, did receive uh, quite a bit of opposition and concern from the water industry. Uh, ultimately, as we step further and further and further into uh, a drought, uh, the issue comes about, you know, what can we do? Uh, there is a study that is uh, supposedly coming out soon that'll uh, depict kind of our ability to, to achieve these uh, these goals. So we'll wait for that study to come out, but I would expect uh, now that the recall election is over, and again, as we're further into this drought, I would expect this legislation to resurface at the start of the legislative session. And so we will continue to discuss these bills uh, once, once they move forward. And last but not least, I wanted to highlight uh, the Dodd bills, uh, famously, you know, called uh, because we talked about them all throughout the uh, the session and even before the session uh, began. But SB 222 related to water affordability and SB 223 related to the discontinuation of residential service. So as these bills did uh, begin to move through the legislature and did get those uh, initial policy hearings, uh, ultimately both bills were stopped and ultimately they, they're now two-year bills. But it's my understanding that the, the author does intend to move these in the new session. So again, we'll pick this back up in January. And West Basin staff has reached out to Aqua to kind of figure out uh, the impacts it would have on, on our individual retailers. Uh, again, uh, these things don't really impact a wholesale water agency. But of course, West Basin would love to uh, play a role as far as uh, finding some middle ground and, and hopefully uh, help and resolve some of the issues uh, there. So we'll continue to track these, but I wanted to highlight those bills for you. And last but not least, uh, I did I mentioned this earlier when we talked about uh, the Newsom recall uh, election, uh, but there was quite a bit of talk about uh, vaccine and vaccination uh, legislation uh, towards the end of the legislative session. It did seem at, a, at least at a certain point that the legislature could move legislation to take uh, or place a, uh, a mandate uh, throughout the state of California. There were two primary proposals that were being discussed. One would be, of course, just a generic mandatory vaccine uh, regulation. And then the other would be kind of a an opportunity to allow or, or permit uh, employers to, to really mandate vaccines. So it kind of give them uh, additional authorities when it comes to that. Uh, ultimately, no legislation was introduced. Uh, but again, now that we see this uh, recall election uh, has failed and and there's really no threat in the new year, uh, I do expect uh, some potential legislation related to vaccinations and or proof of vaccination. So we'll continue to track that, uh, especially uh, in these next coming months when, when uh, you know legislation's not moving forward, but but ultimately these proposed bills are are coming out. So with that, Madam Chair, that's the first half of the legislative update. That's our state update from uh, NPA, Neemel, Poppins and Associates. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have before I begin the federal update. Are there any questions? Yeah, this is Director Houston. I do have a question. Go ahead, please. Sure. Uh, EJ, thank you for the update and I'm I just want to understand the uh, the Revis, I think it was, bill with the 
Brown Act situation because it was sort of going back and forth a little bit, but even today I saw an email thread from special districts that it looks like October 1, we're gonna go back to the regular way we're supposed to do meetings unless, I guess if we, we have to do something with this bill or do some sort of resolution, but you know, I think we all have to understand how that works because it's already the 21st of September. So, Director Houston, I will forward you the uh, executive order signed by uh, Governor Newsom. And really all it does is it, it delays the, the implementation of uh, Assembly Bill 361 until October 1st. Uh, you don't want an overlapping, because of the urgency clause, the bill would take effect immediately. And so what his uh, executive order does is just prolong that until October 1st. Uh, his original uh, declaration would actually be concluded on September 30th. Okay. And so my understanding is that September 30th, the executive order ends. October 1, uh, SB, or excuse me, AB 361 would begin. So I'll have to go through it one more time, but my understanding is that there'll be a seamless transition. Uh, the legislation allows under certain emergency declarations and under uh, certain conditions for special mm -hmm. districts when it comes to health and safety, to hold their meetings remotely, uh, virtually, as long as there's a, a public uh, participation uh, component. So my understanding is that the, the concept would be to align it so that there'd be no, no drop off. Okay, and that, that's my understanding too, but I think there might be a step we have to take in order to be in compliance. I will follow up with that. As I mentioned, when I went through the bill, uh, we'll be discussing this with Steve O'Neill, uh, legal okay. counsel. And so we'll make sure that we're, we're following any steps. But I'll do additional research after this meeting and I'll send the executive order out to you. Okay, great. I'll just say one last thing because this advocacy news that I guess I get from special districts, it's, it's today, but it's actually dated yesterday, it came out the day after, but basically it says starting October 1, remote meetings must transition from the authority of the executive orders to the state law on and after October 1st, all means of special district boards and other elected agencies, they've got to you know, be conducted back to the normal Brown Act, or you've got to meet the requirements of AB 361. So my understanding too is that the special districts were concerned if that had gone into effect, you know, before October 1, everybody would be scrambling. So he, you know, the governor gave us this little extra time. But anyway, you obviously have to talk to legal counsel and find out, do we need to do something before the end of the month so we can be in compliance? Will do. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No, thank you. All right. EJ, can you proceed, please? Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll move now to uh, packet page 27, which is our Van Skoyak Associates uh, update. I'll move through this pretty quickly because August was a, a slightly slower month than normal. Also, uh, last month we did have the chance to have uh, both Pete Evich and uh, Jeff Bowman join us. Uh, but I want to highlight August 10th, obviously the Senate passed HR 3864. This was bipartisan legislation uh, that provided uh, infrastructure funding. Uh, clearly, uh, West Basin has been tracking this. Ultimately, the, the deal uh, includes $550 billion for new spending on what we would call our traditional infrastructure. Including in this is specific funding uh, you can see there's $55 billion for EPA clean drinking water programs. Uh, there is a program uh, uh, update there. So you can see the SRF, our state revolving fund loans. Uh, West Basin has been extremely successful as far as managing that and, and leveraging that for our projects. So we're excited to see that. Uh, that as it states, it's a, a revolving loan. So we all, always have an opportunity to utilize those funding. It's uh, very low interest. So again, West Basin can couple that with grants, our own funding, our PAYGO, and then of course, uh, leverage those low interest loans. So we'll continue to do that. But I wanted to highlight the $8.3 billion uh, for the Bureau of Reclamation. 
you can see there's $550 million for uh, WIN Title 16, and those are the traditional uh, previously uh, approved Title 16, what we call our legacy projects, but also new projects. And so West Basin always had this issue as far as not having one of those um, authorized projects. So now we can actually look to see if there's an opportunity for us to pursue a Title 16 project uh, down the road. You can also see that there's $400 million for WaterSmart. West Basin, again, has been very successful as far as uh, finding grant funds for our, our programs through WaterSmart. There's $450 million for large, uh, large water recycling programs. And obviously, I, I, I couldn't walk past this without pointing out the uh, Metropolitan Water District has been very successful as far as advocating for this. Uh, when you think about uh, these uh, large water recycling programs, large scale uh, facilities, uh, there's no better examples than what Metropolitan Water District is doing with their regional water recycling program. But also if you look to uh, Hyperion and you look at LADWP uh, with their operation next, you see also a, a second great example of potential projects uh, that would be uh, very much worthy of, of funds coming through this uh, large scale water recycling program. So we'll continue to track that, but there is uh, $200 million specifically for the US Army Corps of Engineers and that environmental infrastructure. And that, as you'll recall, is where the Harbor South Bay has been authorized and ultimately reauthorized through our, our project amendment. So we're very excited to see that, that funding come forward. And I just wanted to highlight this because it, it came up during the uh, engineering, engineering and Operations Committee, a question of how we would align our agreement with the US Army Corps of Engineers. And I just wanted to walk through that really quickly just to give uh, uh, maybe a, a more detailed picture of what we're doing and, and how we're working with the US Army Corps of Engineers. So ultimately, when the, the Harbor South Bay project was authorized by Congress, uh, we were given a, a $35 million authorization. Uh, and that's a, a decent number when you think about the fact that it's a 75% uh, investment by the US Army Corps, and it does require a minimum of a 25% match. Now, depending on how much you get appropriated annually, uh, it would depend on what programs and projects you would pursue. Uh, but as you'll recall, uh, as we went through that original $35 million, West Basin began to advocate for a project amendment or a modification, and we were seeking to increase that authorization from 35 to 70. And ultimately, we were successful, but we did so in a, uh, a unique time in Congress. Uh, and the reason it was unique was because there was a moratorium on earmarks. So that would not allow Congress to really get into the details of what the US Army Corps was doing and fund specific projects. So what they would do is they would appropriate funding just as they did here to the US Army Corps. And then the US Army Corps would work to develop their work plan and assign funding to each project. Through actions taken by the House of Representatives as well as the US Senate, uh, they have now actually uh, have been working towards uh, earmarks. And so West Basin has been working with our entire delegation on specific project funding. And that's the reason why we've been working with uh, Representative Maxine Waters, uh, as well as others to kind of try to find specific funding that we could match to a specific project. And we've been fairly successful as far as doing that. Uh, the Mills Park lateral uh, in the city of Carson uh, has been designated as a project that would receive funding. Uh, ultimately, the uh, North Gardena lateral has also been earmarked as a potential project. And we're continuing to work with our two senators uh, as far as getting potential funding for the PV lateral. But I wanted to highlight that because it does require certain advocacy efforts. VSA has been doing an excellent job. I know that uh, Matt Bay is uh, on this meeting as well. Uh, so staff has really been working on, on uh, educating our, our, the staff members from each of our congressional offices to make sure that they would understand the benefits of a project in their congressional district. So we've been very successful as far as that goes, but you will see in the coming months, we'll be bringing forward a specific project amendment with the US Army Corps. And what this allows us to do is actually guide that funding from the Army Corps to our specific projects. But of course, West Basin as a whole, we get to decide 
to some degree how we spend that funding. So annually, you could get anywhere from a million dollars in an appropriation up to about five, maybe six million. And based off of how much we get, we would want to dedicate that money or, or guide that money to a specific project so we can maximize that funding match, the 75 versus 25. So I think that there were some questions as to what projects we would include in that uh, project amendment. I can tell you from our past experience, what we'd like to see is uh, flexibility. Uh, agencies like West Basin Municipal Water District, where we have a lot of R and R projects that we're going to have to pursue in the next uh, several years, uh, but also we have potential uh, opportunities for expansion, whether that be to place water in the ground and pursue IPR projects, uh, add additional treatment in the case where we want to pursue uh, direct potable reuse in the future, or our purple pipe, our laterals to utilize Title 22 for irrigation purposes. We really want to make sure that we leverage that funding and we provide some flexibility. Uh, projects like the Kenneth Hahn lateral that are extremely expensive, those projects would be extremely difficult without significant funding. So you would want to see you know, a large sum of money be dedicated to that. Uh, you know, it, it, the number of projects that you, you provide in that amendment, whether it be 10 to 15, I know we've, we funded 15 projects in the original 35, uh, that's going to be kind of the, the same strategy that we'll want to employ to provide flexibility to our agency uh, as far as uh, the project modification. The staff will be bringing that project um, amendment uh, forward, I believe, in October. Uh, we can discuss that, obviously, in committee and get the feedback from the board. Uh, but we're working right now with our legal counsel, as well as the legal counsel from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, to develop that template for that agreement. I wanted to highlight that because it did come up during ENO, and I think there was a little bit of confusion as to uh, what that agreement would, would require us to do if it prioritizes our projects or guides money to specific projects? Uh, the answer to both of those questions would be no. West Basin would have a lot of flexibility as far as how we work uh, on, on our projects and what we do with the U.S. Army Corps. So last but not least, I just wanted to highlight, if you turn to packet page 28, you can see that House Budget Reconciliation Package. Uh, and that's a procedural process. Uh, you know that uh, both the Senate and the House have been working on uh, potential uh, budget packages. Uh, 13 committees have approved legislation to be included in a reconciliation package uh, that can be used to try and pass uh, Democrats' policies uh, as far as their, their budget requirements. And I just wanted to highlight that because a lot of people see those bills moving forward. Uh, clearly, the Senate would need to take action. And with the 55, or excuse me, 50 50 uh, split in the Senate, it does make it very difficult to, to uh, build consensus around a package. Uh, and with that in mind, you can see the fiscal year, the federal fiscal year, coming to a close. Uh, in fact, uh, this month, uh, the end of September, you'll, you'll see that happen. Uh, and so you can see there, uh, there's a section uh, Congress set for a busy September. You are starting to see a little bit about that in the press. Uh, obviously, Congress would need to pass a budget. Uh, the idea or the hope of them doing so has, you know, you, you get high hopes and then you, you kind of come down to reality. Uh, we're expecting a continuing re resolution. And I think that that's, from West Basin's perspective, you know, it's, it's not a positive thing because we know that we have funding within the Senate and within the House uh, for our specific projects and a continuing resolution uh, would not fund projects like that. So the hope would be that if they do a continuing resolution, that would be uh, a temporary stopgap, and then hopefully Congress would take action on a longer-term budget uh, in the near future. Uh, but we'll continue to uh, track that issue, and of course uh, uh, see where we where we fit when it comes to our, our project funding with the U.S. Army Corps. Uh, our relationship with the the L.A. District Office has been very positive, so so we're actually working with them on on the alternative strategy, which would be to be included in their fiscal year working plan. Uh, we received a million dollars last year, so we would hope to continue that. Uh, and I know that our engineering team is doing an excellent job of working with that, the staff there. Uh, so we're kind of taking it from two different angles uh, with the one strategy of, of getting federal funding for our Harbor South Bay project. And so with that, Madam Chair, that's all I have for item 6A. Okay, thank you, EJ. Are there any questions, board members?
All right, and hearing none. Um, let's see, we're on closed session, or did you do? You did MWD reports, so we're on closed session. Madam Chair, uh, we still have item 6B, the, the Metropolitan Water District update. All right, then can you do that one, please? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, this item 6B, as I mentioned, is our Metropolitan Water District update for August of 2021. And we do have our uh, water policy analyst, Tammy Hurley, here uh, to give us our Metropolitan Water District update. Take it away. Thank you, EJ. Good afternoon, Chair Gray, member, dear, and board director. Uh, this memo includes a summary of Met Metropolitan Water District programs. And in addition to the August board activities, I will provide a short summary on a couple of the ongoing programs of interest. And these include the Metropolitan uh, report from the Shaw Law Group, um, the rate refinement, and uh, recent board actions. And then finally, I'll conclude with a brief summary of the current water uh, supply conditions. So um, the first item is condition to water supply alert. The Metropolitan Board declared a water supply alert, uh, which you um, have all heard about now. And uh, this moves it from a water condition uh, watch position to alert position. <clears throat> and this action will aid Metropolitan in communicating the region's water supply situation. And this will be very important in helping to preserve the water supplies as well. Um, so if we go to yeah page 30 of the packet, it shows the framework um, shown on the screen here. So um, this is the third of a four-step water supply framework that Metropolitan has. Um, and you know with this action, you know the Metropolitan is urging cities and local agencies to um, you know really highlight the urgency of water conservation. Um, and what they also want to do is they also want to support the regional conservation message to support the governor's call for voluntary conservation measures, um, you know, from the fall of 2021 throughout summer of 2022. Um, the next item is Metropolitan's response to employee concerns. So as mentioned last month, the Shaw Law Group, they completed their final report uh, related to equal opportunity employment allegations. And during the August board meeting, the board took action to address these recommendations and directed the general manager to implement a series of actions. Um, the report includes over 45 recommendations and listed in this committee memo on, uh, yeah, that we're looking at right now, page 31. There's five primary recommendations uh, that the Shell Law Group has identified. And these are intended to be referred to as foundational function to the overall recommendations that they have included in their report. So the first item uh, it is to elevate the uh, EEO office to an independent department. And while this was a recommendation, there was a discussion among the committee members of the Operations Personnel and Technology Committee uh, just to have this particular position report to the general manager's office instead of reporting directly to the board. Um, so the board did approve having that particular office report to the general manager and the board um, directed the general manager and that office to develop the shell report implementation program and report monthly, um, a monthly update to the operations personnel and technology uh, committee members. So additional items of the foundational recommended uh, recommendations are also listed on uh, this report. So number two is to create three additional internal investigator positions, um, establish D, uh, de and i manager position to lead and guide the council to identify and implement best practices create additional positions in the training unit and employee relations department and to designate a committee and allocate funds for metropolitan to implement the recommendations that are outlined in the report so um, as part of this element, the general manager is um, establishing a joint management advisory committee, which will be led by the bargaining unit, the management, ethics, and legal departments. 
and the advisory committee will be tasked to review uh, key items and make recommendations for implementation um, to the general manager that will be taken to the board. So these recommendations are designed to align Metropolitan uh, with the best practices. And the Shaw Law Group has also made recommendations about the board's oversight role to include requiring reports to include additional quantitative information about certain issues, um, to carefully evaluate EEO-related information, provide support and resources to resolve issues, and to model professionalism and respectful behavior. So additionally, they have recommended to conduct an annual employee survey for at least the next five years. Uh, and this is in an effort to evaluate Metropolitan progress on implementing these recommendations. So in summary, the general manager has been working with his team and has made some good progress in response to this report. Uh, so next item regarding the rate refinement. Um, so Metropolitan staff has prepared a report of the rate refinement process, which includes uh, what has been reviewed by the member agency work group during the past several months. Um, the goal of the work group has been to identify different methods and to provide technical feedback to Metropolitan staff for a different option to establish a mechanism in recovering Metropolitan's cost for demand management. So initially, the work group reviewed a set of guiding principles to provide policy objectives in proposing adjustment to the rate structure framework. And then the work group reviewed and evaluated the alternatives that have been presented already by the board um, that was presented by the Rough Tellus group and to provide feedback with additional suggestions for cost recovery alternatives. So in addition to all of that, the group, we also researched uh, historical rate information um, going back from the mid 1990s through 2003, which were part of the board discussion back then and what led us to the current rate structure um, that is formed right now that we've been working with for the past few years. So if we can look at um, the top of page 32, yeah, perfect, where that little chart is, that table, it has several rate alternatives. So this is a list is what was emerged from the work group. So each of these will have a different cost functionalization mechanism. Um, the last one, uh, alternative number eight, it does not require the functionalization of a demand management cost because that would be recovered based on, um, they're not recovered based on system usage. Um, it uses other metrics such as assessed valuation and population. So these items, um, in addition to what RAF TELUS um, has already provided, are being uh, brought to the Finance and Insurance Committee and the board members for their review and discussion. So it's important to understand what the mechanism of demand management collection is and what it's paying for. So historically, Metropolitan established programs to reduce water demand by reducing um, uh, water demand through the conservation program and incentivizing development of local projects. And this has been found to offer long-term reliability at the lowest possible cost. And Metropolitan incurs costs for demand management to avoid capital expansion and operation along with maintenance costs. So in the past, the water stewardship rate recovered all of the demand management costs because it functionalizes 100% transportation as part of the distribution, conveyance, and aquifer function. So currently, the demand management uh, funding program will expire um, fiscal year 20 or fiscal year ending 2023. And the recent integrated resources plan uh, projected that the impact of the demand management programs have been realized. Uh, metropolitan programs that are put in place to manage demand are now re relied upon very heavily. Um, and if we go to page 33 of the board packet, um, at the top shows a graphic. This was um, the report that was presented to the board by Rock Ellis Group um, some time ago. And um, uh, their report validates the need for a functional assignment 
of demand management cost. So three of the alternatives, one, two, and three A, uh, they apply the functionalization of demand management costs proposed, meaning that demand management costs are allocated based on the function demand management served within Metropolitan's operations and are recovered based on the water conveyance system utilization. Um, and the fourth alternative is shown is a different metric, uh, which is what I had mentioned earlier. Um, it relies on a different metric, uh, such as assessed valuation or population. So as you can tell, there are some differences with these two tables shown in the committee packet. And it shows the other alternative options that the work group has been discussing um, and this is basically a result of their analysis. Um, there will be continued discussions among the board members met at Metropolitan during the upcoming board retreat and um, during next month's Finance and Insurance Committee. And Metropolitan staff will be seeking board direction um, to bring back demand management, a cost recovery mechanism um, that can be implemented. So in summary, Metropolitan has historically been very successful in recovering demand management costs, which has reduced the need to spend on upgrades to the infrastructure and supplemental water resources. And to continue these successful programs in water reliability and resilience, the adoption of a funding mechanism is needed. Um, that pretty much my summary on um, recent metropolitan program. So before I move on to the next part, are there any questions? Are there any questions, board members? Hearing none, Tammy, please move on. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the board meeting actions uh, included in attachment A is a list of items that were heard last month in August. Um, attachment B includes a summary of the board member vote results for August. And attachment C is a draft list of items um, that have been brought to the committee um, in September. And just moving on to the water supply update um, included in this report as attachment D are the graphics that depict the current water supply conditions through August 29th. And on the first page, it highlights the major reservoir or major watersheds in California with a state water project as well as the Colorado River Basin. And in the middle of the page, there's a chart titled the Metropolitan Storage Reserve Levels. Um, this is a bar chart to depict how much water is available in Metropolitan Storage Reserves. And based on current demand projections, um, Metropolitan anticipates more than 600,000 acre feet of a supply gap for this year. Now, they will be able to meet all of their demands this year, and they'll be able to do this by withdrawing supplies from their dryer storage accounts, purchasing transfer supplies, and shifting operations to maximize delivery of the Colorado River water. So this year has shaped up to be drier than the last drought uh, by far. The state water uh, projects, the largest reservoir at Lake Oroville, it currently is only at 22% of total capacity. Um, it's at its lowest level ever recorded since 1977. Um, if we look at the second page, um, more detail is shown for these areas. And uh, Lake Oroville, it shows a graphic as well. It's highly likely that this reservoir storage will end the year um, at record low levels. So there was recent precipitation in this area. However, there was just no increase for the inflow into the reservoir because the soils were just so dry. Um, so as such, it's anticipated that the initial 2022 allocation for the state water contractors will be at 0%. Um, with regard to conditions along the Colorado River, um, looking at the bottom right corner for Lake Mead, the level dropped below the shorted trigger, uh, below 10,075 feet in elevation last month. Um, it is projected to be at 1,068 feet at the end of this calendar year. And as I mentioned last month, um, USBR was going to publish a 24 month, uh, August 24 month study, which they did. and um, as a result of that, they have made a declaration. They have declared a first ever shortage along the Colorado River. 
So this shortage will trigger action to coup um, for the states of Arizona, Nevada, and the country of Mexico to comply. Um, they will ultimately have to collectively reduce the water use by more than 600,000 acre feet. And under these shortage conditions, um, California is not required to make any Lake Mead contribution because of the senior water rights that they hold. However, California will be required to make supply contributions if Lake Mead's elevation falls below 1,045 feet in elevation. So California would then make a contribution under the drop contingency plan um, anywhere between 250 to 350,000 acre feet each year. Um, and also under the drought contingency plan, Metropolitan will be able to take delivery of their ICS supplies, the intentionally created surplus supplies, um, if needed. So in summary, um, the Oroville watershed during 2020 and 2021 are the second driest two-year period um, on record following the years 1976 and 77. And the conditions are similar to the upper Colorado River Basin. The water year hydrology is the driest year on record with Lakes Powell and Mead at record low levels. Um, that concludes my report and my summary um, for water supply. So please let me know if you have any other questions. Are there any questions? No, thank you. I'm here. No. Uh, I think the next item is closed session. Any closed session, EJ? Madam Chair, we have no closed session. And then I believe the next item is uh, comments from the board. Any comments from the board? Sure. Yeah. Don and Deere, I just say a very informative meeting. Thank you very much. Any others? Sure, this is uh, looking, looking forward to the meeting. All right, any other comments? Yes, it's Director Houston. Yes. Um, a really good meeting. I just want to circle back real quick, EJ, and I'll send you a note because I was looking too. So, from what I'm seeing with the special districts, there is apparently we have to pass some sort of a resolution or do something in order to continue holding these type of meetings come october 1. so you know it's there's some steps in there and there's a whole bunch of information starting to come out from special districts between yesterday and today so you definitely need to check with legal counsel um because we've got a board meeting coming up by next week if we want to make sure we're going to be in compliance on October 1st to keep doing these meetings this way. Otherwise, the way I understood it is it reverts back to the way the brand normally works. We've got to post where people are located so they could teleconference. I'll follow up with Steve O'Neill today and yeah. we'll, we'll be ready to go. If we need to take action on Monday, we'll be ready to do so. Okay, yeah, and I'll forward you this email as well. So, thank, thank you. you. All right, thank you, uh, EJ, and thank you, board members and staff. It was a great meeting, great reports, uh, and we appreciate it. And so with that, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Bye -bye.